Hi everyone and welcome. Today we'll talk about anti-reverse engineering techniques. These techniques aim at preventing the program from running in the bug mode in order to make reverse engineering process more difficult. This makes code obfuscation more effective as the engineer will not be able to navigate the code with the debugger. Debuggers such as GDB and strace rely upon the function ptrace. Only one process at a time is allowed to call ptrace. Programmers can have the code calling ptrace internally in order to prevent users from opening additional debugging sessions. And that's an example. This line over here is going to tell me whether this application is being debugged. And if it is, this variable debug is going to be one and I'm going to get this printout on the screen. So let's see what happens when we compile and run the code. Okay, so as you can see, I'm not getting any printout here, right? So I'm going to run it inside the debugger. Okay, so I'm going to place my breakpoint in here. As you can see, this one is, is going to be zero at the beginning. And now is one, and I can have it printed here as well, the bug one. So my application was able to detect that it's being run into a debugger. If you are a Linux user, you will probably already know what this directory does. The following file, status, contains a list of properties that describe the process PID, and that will be the ID of your process, there will be a number, right? Now, if your process is being traced, then state and tracer PID, which is the ID of the tracing process, will be set accordingly by the operating system. Now, monitoring these fields does not produce reliable results as their behavior can be changed using several techniques. So you can actually protect this value by, well, there are several techniques and you might need to recompile the kernel. Now, Windows. The is debugger present is a kernel 32 API function that returns one if a debugger is present. And that's an example how to use the function. Now, techniques based upon is the bugger present can be easily circumvented by opportunely setting breakpoints and by manually resetting the AAX so that the function is no longer able to trigger the jump to the code that forces the old program to exit. So you have this function working correctly, you are debugging, so you're getting one, but then because you are setting a breakpoint, you can get to change the EAX back to zero so that the code is never going to execute the exit, right? Process environment block. In the Windows NT operating system family, this is a structure that is strongly linked to the eProcess one, which is the process object for the process. Now, PEB contains structures that describe processes such as startup parameters, the program image base address, and so on. PEB also contains two fields that can help in identifying whether a process is being debugged. These two. And now 
an example on how to use these type of values. And I'm going to give you some time to have a look at this and you can pause it anyway if you need more time. I'm about moving to the next slide, so if you need more time, you can pause it. So you're getting exceptions. The idea behind this is to cause unnecessary exception in order to confuse the engineer. These might be achieved, for example, by accessing inaccessible memory spaces, dividing by zero, and using interrupt one and interrupt three instructions. Stack manipulation. The aim is trying to confuse the engineer and the reverser by faking a sequence of instructions the mimic function calling conventions where there is no function. This can be achieved by opportunely using the instructions push, pop and write so that the engineer or the reverser they are really going to think that you are calling a function but you are not. Checking execution time. A program can figure it out whether it's been run into a debugger by looking at the execution time. Any line of code that takes longer than expected to complete, normally less than a second, might indicate that the program is being debugged. Let's have a look at the example. Now, here I'm grabbing the initial timestamp and then I save it in EBX. And here is where the actual program will be. I just put a bunch of move. And here I grab the final timestamp and then I calculate the actual timing using just a sub. And then I compare the value that I get from the sub to 10 or whatever the value you want to use. And then if this value is bigger, you're going to grab this string over here and you're going to print it. The bug might be on, otherwise the program exit. So with a very small value I expect the program to actually print something on the screen. Let's see what happens. I build the code and I launch it and here it is. That's my string. Let's change the value we put something much bigger let's see if we still get the message on the screen no message let's have a look at the code again Preventing execution in virtual machines. Execution in virtual environments might be disabled by programmers for several reasons, including preventing users from breaching the license agreement, preventing reverse engineers from running a debugger in a more efficient way, and so on. The assembly instruction CPU ID, returns family model, and brand string for the processor and can be used to figure out whether the program is running on a real CPU or an hypervisor. Let's have a look at the example. Now, Linux comes with a very nice wrapper for this instruction. So, 
and false because obviously that's not a virtual machine and this one allows you to have a look at the actual byte right as you can see it's all zero nothing is set now let's have a look at the assembly that does something similar as you can see and I'm grabbing the leaf as you can see 31 31 right this is where the information that I need is located let's see what happens if I compile this code and I run it now I'll grab my debugger and I stop here so that's not a virtual machine so there shouldn't be any jump right next Yep, and in fact, it didn't jump, right? We can have a look at it again. Run, next, next, next. And no jump, right? Just bear in mind that some hypervisors allow system administrators to either change values returned by CPU ID by simply editing a configuration file. And that's the reason why you should use multiple techniques in order to make sure that your application is actually running to a virtual machine. And that's another one. You will be looking for service name. Now, those are the services that uh, VMware generally installs. Those are the ones for VisualBox, QEMU, and Visual PC. Um, don't trust whatever I've written in here. Always double check the updated documentation. Right? That's just to give you an idea of what needs to be done. The same thing can be said about the directories where um, files are installed and copy over. Those are just some of the location that uh, you'll be finding on a Windows machine. Again, double check the documentation. Same thing can be said about registry entries, again for Windows and Windows only. Additional checks. Uh, you can check the amount of memory. Generally, um, machines that are assigned very small amount of memory are which machine. Um, same thing can be said for machines that run on a single processor. Uh, same thing can be said about machines that run on a small disk size and screen size is also something you may want to check. Again, your application can check for um, other applications that are running, especially the bugger. So your application might be checking whether WinDBG is running or IDA Pro or Ghidra and so on. And again, if you want to prevent other people from having a look at your code, you want to implement any strategy able to make memory dumps appear confusing to engineers and automated tools. So you don't want to stop these memory dumps from happening, you just want to make them confused. Now, also, you want to modify PE and ELF sections so that their properties return wrong values. Also, you want to modify the PAB sections so that its structures return wrong values. And that will be all for today. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed my class.